Hello, this 15 minute segment will cover non-traumatic pediatric bowel emergencies presenting to the emergency department that prompt radiologic imaging. Evaluating a child with abdominal pain begins with knowing what happens at what age. Abdominal pain is a common presentation with both trivial and life-threatening causes. The majority of pediatric abdominal complaints are relatively benign, such as constipation, but it's important to pick up on the signs that might suggest a more serious underlying disease such as a ovulus in the newborn or appendicitis in children. Once the decision is made to image, the imager uses all the data to formulate the relevant questions and identify the correct modality to provide the answers, keeping in mind that no one way is always the best. As part of the healthcare team, the pediatric radiologists need be familiar with the clinical perspectives, understand the role of imaging and its limitations to help guide the clinician. Imaging evaluation may require any combination of advanced techniques, including ultrasound, fluoroscopy, CT, and MRI. The most performed initial examination remains the abdominal radiograph. Despite its widespread use, particularly in the emergency department, the sensitivity and specificity of the abdominal radi radiograph are quite variable. A two-view abdomen series or orthogonal imaging, supine and upright, or the left lateral decubitus in an infant, is helpful for acute pathology and has a high diagnostic yield, but low specificity for major pathology. In this upright and supine images of the abdomen, we see dilated bowel gas with multiple air fluid levels. Be sure to always look for pneumoperitoneum, or free air in the abdomen, as presented here. These supine and left lateral decubitus films demonstrate the football sign of air in the peritoneal cavity, outlining the falciform malignant, and in the left lateral decubitus position, show air between the liver and the abdominal wall, as highlighted here in yellow. The vomiting child indicates bowel pathology. I always ask my clinician, what color is the vomit? Non-bilious emesis, depending on the qualifiers of type and frequency, which may spur that clinician to think of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, such as in the age range of two weeks to two months, or other causes of vomiting may be due to paralytic ileus, such as viral gastroenteritis versus a mechanical obstruction which may occur at any age. Ileus emesis, however, is an emergency and indicates that there's significant bowel pathology. Bile is green, green like forest green, as in this suction catheter here, or on these surgical chucks here. In hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, ultrasound is used for diagnosis. The baby is placed in the right side down and given glucose water. But be careful not to over distend the stomach. You can see the fluid go through the pylorus into the duodenal bulb, demarcated by the yellow triangle. Pi loric stenosis, or the Greek single symbol pi, 3.14, is a good way to remember the measurements. However, we like the muscle and pyloric channel length greater than 16 millimeters and wall, one single wall thickness greater than 3.5 millimeters, as shown in red. Numbers are smaller in premature or younger babies, with the differential including pyloraspasm, antral gastritis, granuloma, or eosinophilic enteritis. The mnemonic AIM, A-A-I-I-M-M, -M, is a great way to remember the major factors in pediatric bowel obstruction. Many other causes as well, using the mnemonic vitamin C for your differential diagnosis, such as vascular, shunline, and oxygen-line purpura, et cetera, will not be covered in this 15-minute segment, but being familiar with the age and clinical presentation will lead your radiographic workup for, a for the pediatric bowel emergency at hand. Adhesions are fibrous bands that occur after surgery, which can develop days to weeks after the procedure and may lead to bowel obstruction requiring adhesiolysis. This three-month-old, two months post-surgery, presents with, with non-bilious emesis and intermittent inconsolable episodes. The plain film demonstrates dilated small bowel, width of the bowel loops greater than the diameter of the underlying vertebral body, with multiple air fluid levels on upright imaging. The child initially was thought to have intussusception, so an ultrasound was performed. During the ultrasound, no intussusception was found, but there was abundant portal venous gas noted in the liver, consistent with bacterial translocation of endotoxin from the compromised intestine. This was a surgical emergency, and he went to the operating room and required 10 centimeters of bowel resection for adhesiolysis of the adhesions from the prior surgery. Appendicitis is one of the most common evaluations performed in the ED. The published ACR appropriateness criteria is a good reference to start, but it depends on the clinical risk level of the child's presentation when trying to decide what imaging modality is best. The ideal imaging test for appendicitis would be readily available, fast, inexpensive, reproducible, safe, 
and that would accurately distinguish child, a child with the disease from those with a normal appendix. What's the best imaging test? Well, it depends. Clinical scoring schemes, such as the pediatric appendicitis score, may be helpful to stratify patients into categories and provide a more rational utilization of imaging resources and radiation dose reduction. Published protocols include a combination of ultrasound and CT. If findings at ultrasound are inconclusive or fail to show the appendix, then CT with IV and oral contrast should be performed, some advocating rectal contrast and limiting the field of view to the abdomen and pelvis. MRI is used in some institutions when availability permits, but the overall goal is to reduce the negative laparotomy rate. Bottom line is that imaging in patients with appendicitis should be performed as an adjunct to, not instead of, the physical examination. Ultrasound is the first mod line modality for evaluating children with appendicitis. Keeping in mind that females have other etiologies you need to exclude, so performing a pelvic ultrasound as well to exclude ovarian pathology is crucial. A transabdominal curvilinear probe for the pelvic ultrasound portion to assess the ovaries excludes the five adnexal masses, abscess, torsion, ectopic, or benign or malignant ovarian tumors, and graded compression using a linear transducer from the right upper quadrant to the right lower quadrant need be performed, as well as over into the left lower quadrant for those extra long appendices. You want to assess the origin of the appendix coming from the cecum, and if you're really lucky, like that's demonstrated here in this video clip, the appendix will drape nicely over the iliac vessels. Keep in mind that a normal appendix has been reported to be seen in up to 85% of normal cases, so keep trying. A few cases are as simple as this. A 13-year-old with abdominal pain had refused dinner the prior evening. She came home from school early due to periumbilical pain. Three hours later, her pain is located to a right lower quadrant, and she has rebound tenderness and a fever of 102. A curvilinear pelvic ultrasound demonstrated normal ovaries and no free fluid. A linear transducer with greater compression demonstrates a tubular, non-compressible, finger-like structure coming out of the uh, cecum with a central shadowing appendicle lift. Echogenic fat surrounding the, was also noted, surrounding the appendix, as you can see here, and the appendix measured more than six millimeters outer to outer. Color Doppler imaging demonstrates peripheral hyperemia. Not one size fits all, and knowing that some limitations are key to interpretation and knowing when to go to the next step in the radiographic workup, such as uh, an echogenic abscess or a retrocecal appendix or perforation, the location of the appendix deep to compressibility, such as in the pelvis, or the experience of the sonographer, body habitus of the individual, or if the patient is non-compliant or in too much pain, really does limit the study. This four-year-old who has no free fluid on ultrasound has multiple peripherally hypoechoic, centrally hyperechoic, ovoid lymph nodes noted in the periumbilical region. The appendix was not seen on imaging, and the patient was noted had an elevated white blood cell count and rebound rebound tenderness, which prompted a CT with IV and oral contrast as the retrocecal region was not evaluated. On axial and coronal CT, you can see this uh, non-contrast filling appendix and uh, dilate it with dilatation greater than one centimeter, uh, which was consistent with acute appendicitis. This 12-year-old presented with right lower quadrant pain, elevated white blood cell count, and MSS times two, you can see this arcuate shadowing structure immediately superior to the bladder with increased peripheral color Doppler flow. The appendix was not visualized. And the CT scan demonstrated normal appendix as seen here with the pink arrow with a large stool aggregate in the rectum. So that's what was seen on the prior ultrasound was a large stool ball. So the CT scan can define the extent of the abscess and potential access for drainage for uh, image-guided procedures. Complications of acute appendicitis range from perforation to portal pyemia and local or distant abscess formation. The first image here shows an appendicle lift with a periappendiceal abscess. The central image demonstrates two liver abscesses, and the third image demonstrates thrombus in the superior mesenteric vein extending into the portal vein. The infectious process originated within the abdomen and reached the liver by embolization or seeding of the portal vein. 
with the increased use of antibiotics for intra-abdominal infections, portal pyemia is now a less frequent cause of pyogenic liver abscess, but still accounts for about 20% of the cases. Not that MRI is indicated in every case, but here we can demonstrate the difference between MRI and CT scan. In the left lower image, MRI is better at showing the distribution of bad transiohepatic attenuation differences evidenced by the low intensity centrally within the liver. And on this other image here in the right lower aspect of the screen, you can see the abscess, but do not see the appendicolith as nicely on the MRI imaging. Incarcerated inguinal hernias or incarcerated hernias in the intraperitoneal and inguinal region is when bowel is non-reproducible to the original or original or normal location. Here we can see gas overlying the right inguinal crease. And this was consistent with an incarcerated inguinal hernia. Plain film here demonstrates abnormal bowel gas pattern with a soft tissue rounded mass density over the region of the umbilicus, but also asymmetry of the inguinal folds as mark demarcated here with the yellow highlight. This patient went to surgery for a bowel containing incarcerated hernia, and uh, ultrasound can at times be helpful for further evaluation or justification as needed. Intussusception is when the bowel in, in, uh, telescopes inside itself, typically the ilium into the cecum. And uh, the toddler typically presents with intermittent crampy abdominal pain and oftentimes some current jelly stool. Plain film or ultrasound is the first line of choice. If you do get a plain film, that may demonstrate lateralization of the ilium or air fluid levels, as you can see here in the left lateral decubitus, or paucity of gas overlying the cecum as in this supine radiograph. I'm sorry, is in this prone radiograph. Rarely will you see the intussusceptum outlined by air as we do see here in the right upper quadrant in this patient. On ultrasound, the cross-section of view demonstrates a pseudo-kidney sign, which is a cross-section of the intussusceptum invaginating itself into the intussuscipians, whereas on axial section, you may see target sign with central small bowel telescoping its side into the large bowel or the intussuscipians. Plain film prior to reduction is performed to be sure no pneumoperitoneum is present. IV large bore catheter is placed for fluid resuscitation. A surgical consult is warranted, and some institutions do require antibiotics prior to the procedure. A 14 gauge angiocatheter poised for decompression is available as needed, and air or both uh, air um, or water-soluble contrast material are both acceptable for reduction in lieu of surgery. The end point of which you wanna see the soft tissue mass pushing, being pushed by the column of air or contrast into the small bowel. Under three months of age, pathologic lead points include Meckel's diverticulum, duplications, or hamartomas. Children's over three include lymphoma, polyps, appendiceal inflammation, or other inflammatory processes such as penostrum line purpura. This teen demonstrated lymphoma on CT as the cause of the intussusception. This duplication cyst of the ilium was the cause of this infant's intussusception, demonstrated during laparotomy for patients' ileal duplication cystectomy. You can see the ilium intussuscepting into the cecum. Malrotation in mid-gut bobulus warrants imaging prior to the OR for LADS procedure uh, if there is a high enough clinical suspicion, no imaging is warranted. Normal rotation occurs at five weeks in utero. During physiologic herniation of the foregut, the small bowel proliferates, goes a, undergoes a 270 degree rotation with the intestine returning into the abdominal cavity in normal fixation. So that there is a long mesentery as noted here. The short mesenteric base predisposes the bowel to twist upon its pedicle, which can cause external extrinsic compression of the bowel, and if persistent, occlusion of the mesenteric vessels, which is called mid-gut volvulus. Upper GI is the gold standard. Normal is on the left here. The duodenum extends retroperitoneally 
and on AP image crosses midline up to the level of the duodenal bulb to the left of the pedicle. The images on the right do not demonstrate the duodenum to come up to the level of, of the bulb to the left of the pedicle. And that was consistent with malrotation with mid gut volvulus, which is an emergent, requires emergent surgery. Detorsing or turning back the hands of time with separation of adhesions at laparotomy. Being familiar with the whirlpool sign and differentiating from intussusception is crucial. Normally, the SMV is the patient's right of the SMA. Here on the bottom left image, we can see the SMV to the left of the SMA. Here's the aorta. Ultrasound with Doppler can detect malrotation with high sensitivity from 92 to 100% of the time. Careful that the longitudinal view of midgut volvulus or the whirlpool sign can look like a pseudo kidney sign. Imaging real time will help differentiate target sign of intussusception from the whirlpool sign of malrotation. As we see here, where the SMV is swirled in the clockwise direction, which is abnormal. So the SMV is to the left of the SMA. The SMV is to the left of the patient's SMA, which is abnormal. Upper GI is the gold standard. You can see here that this child was malrotation, malrotated and also had mid-gut volvulus. Methyl's diverticulum is a remnant of the omphalomesenteric duct connecting the small bowel to the umbilicus. And it's located along the anti-mesenteric border. 30% of the time it has ectopic gastric mucosa and may cause interception bleeding or obstruction. A Meckel scan using a technetium 99M protechnicate will show persistent accumulation of the radio tracer, tracer and CT and ultrasound can demonstrate abnormal fluid collection. The miscellaneous category is vast and using your clinical acumen can help guide appropriate imaging. This concludes pediatric bowel emergencies to aim for imaging for collect correct clinical diagnosis.